just uh, briefly introduce myself. My name is Thomas Mars. I'm the Director of Operations here at GKN Sweden in Trollhättan, uh, running our rotating parts product area, where, as far as I consider, we have the toughest and tightest uh, requirements, the most uh, challenging parts. Uh, my counterpart is not here to state otherwise, so that's good. So the rotating parts here, uh, it's uh, about uh, 275,000 shop hours. Uh, we are what we consider a one-stop shop for, for rotors. We have all processes in-house. Uh, of course, we have uh, milling, turning, drilling, broaching. We have all surface treatments. We have all the thermal coatings. We have all uh, inspection and non-destructive testing. Uh, we actually have destructive testing as well in form of a GE and, uh, uh, and Pratt and & Rolls approved uh, materials lab, which is actually a great asset to have. Uh, we serve several different customers and programs. Uh, we have our own uh, RM12 for the Swedish uh, fighter, the Gripen. We have uh, some high volume pro programs in GE and X and the GTF engines. And then we have some derivatives and then some uh, uh, more mature programs for CF6 and uh, PW2000. Uh, but uh, a nice uh, portfolio. Uh, we first, fo okay, first we running the, the shop, we focus of course on people and safety. Safety first, are our people safe? But once that, it's all about focus on quality, quality, quality. With the idea, if we set the quality right, more or less, the rest will follow. Give us time to uh, optimize and uh, automatize. But focus on quality is what we try to drive. And uh, try to talk around one product, uh, for example. This is a 3D printed copy of a fan hub for one of our customers. Uh, I would guess it's about uh, uh, twice as big in real life. It's, uh, Quite nice to have those plastic uh, parts printed just for, for display. Uh, in our, our mind, this is a high volume product for us. I would say around 500, 550 pieces per year. And uh, extremely tight tolerances. For some splines in here, uh, we have down to plus minus three microns. And I think that's the tightest requirement we have within the whole uh, workshop in Trollhättan. And uh, we could not find any supplier of machineries or tools that even wanted to quote this because they could not guarantee a result to be within tolerance. And I don't know if all of you can relate to plus minus three microns. It's roughly about taking a piece of hair and slice it to 15 pieces or something. It's very tight. Uh, so focus on quality, we actually went, uh, went about to develop our own technology uh, to manufacture this, we're, uh, which we have developed and patented with a, actually a 100% yield. So it's actually slightly proud of that, slightly. Uh, but apart from that, we'll be working extremely data-driven with a dedicated long-term uh, focus on uh, reaching a high level of quality. Uh, use customer involvement to discuss uh, the requirements and uh, can we change requirements from uh, different areas. Uh, having drawing reviews together. Of course, working with cross-functional teams in our own uh, within our own company, involving suppliers, actually involving a lot of tool suppliers to control those tight requirements. It's a lot about uh, controlling the tools that, uh, and the machines that, uh, that makes their, 
uh, produced as the requirements. And then I'm gathering a lot of data, a lot of measurements from uh, uh, qu uh, quality statistics. Do we have uh, uh, any kind of a deviation, any kind of trend in our CPK data? Just and, and then analyzing that continuously with our um, ME team and, and so on. Uh, soon going to show a bit more from the from the workshop once we have that and we have reached a high level of quality uh, there's about 400 different uh, characteristics on this part and uh, starting with a uh, three sigma i say 97 percent roughly it varies a bit from week to week but roughly 97 percent above three sigma i guess you know know your data, then that uh, at least 99.7% is expected to be within tolerance. And then we have, once we have that, once we have robusticized, then we can go on to automatize. And with that robust processes, can I point with this? I don't know. Uh, then we can go about to make those the programs as unmanned as possible. We have all machines uh, connected live, so we can see how they perform. So this um, machine in particular for some time period here uh, was 89.1% uh, working, actually cutting chips. And uh, we also measure how much time do we get out of the machine when no one is in the workshop. So within this time period, I guess it's a week, I can't really read the numbers, we got 47 hours machine running when no one is in the workshop. So almost for free. Uh, and then we measure server machines as a, at the same time. Are they running? You can see, are they, uh, are they in production? And I'll get a bit more into this picture trying to show live from the workshop. But, of course, as everyone can realize, once we get this, once we achieve this with the high predictability, the high quality, then we can start making money. Uh, <laughs> so, see if this works. Uh, so, start with this picture. This is how we run our daily operations. And this is actually a little bit new to us. We used to have uh, a lot of manual boards, but now all the different levels of managers have a digital board and everything aggregates and is uh, summarized up to my level. So of course we start in the upper end there with the people and safety. People here, everyone's safe, everyone, uh, everyone here as expected. Do you have any safety issues with personnel or parts? Once that, we go into queue quality. And then focus on delivery. Inventory there is a, is a, a new measurement there for the, for the value stream manager. And then we measure productivity in the form of how are we making the hours. But this is uh, uh, quite nice which, and the, a way to uh, everyone work in the same way. You can share information uh, instantly between different departments up and down in the organization. Everything online all the time. Uh, and then signal of course if anything is red, a machine issue that needs to be escalated to, uh, to, uh, to me, that we need, some, need to do something. Then we go into more detail planning. You will recognize this part in the picture. So each box here represents one operation. So this is what we use for our detail planning. This is live from the system. I think it's updated every 15 minutes, I think. And every number represents one unique part in the flow. 
And then we can see there, over to the left here, last week we were supposed to deliver nine pieces. We delivered 14, so maybe a bit overproduction, but okay. This week the target is 11, zero so far. Hopefully okay, because we delivered some extra last week. And then we can look into this week, and if anything here is red, it means we're too late in the week. So this is not a pretty picture. It actually comes down to, uh, in this case, lack of material. We've been having three or four weeks in a row without any startups. Yesterday, we received a big bunch of parts, so hopefully we can start filling up the flow. But anyway, it's a, it's a very nice visualization of the production and where the parts are. Do you have any issues? If you pile up 12 pieces here, as we have, what's going on there? And so on. So it's a very nice way to track and monitor the, the operations. Uh, and then we go into... Uh, uh, this is also live there. We do actually have a bit of a signal problem from last day's uh, thunder. But anyway, this is actually live and up and running. Uh, watching some, some of our decal machines producing those parts. So right now, black is not good. I don't like blacks. That means that machine is down for uh, maintenance. Uh, sometimes it's uh, planned maintenance, preventive maintenance. This happens uh, not to be. So, but the forecast is they should be back up and running tomorrow. But then we monitor those machines. They are green, means they are cutting chips. So it's processing, uh, rapid traverse, it changes all the time. So it's, it's continuously monitoring the, the process. Uh, we get the data here that for this machine, in 27 minutes, the, the product will be finished. And uh, we have equipped the operators with uh, watches that are connected to the machines. So the operator, they're probably on lunch break right now. 11.28, yep. So actually having the watch, the clock, they can see that it's 27 minutes left, and they know, okay, I can sit here for another 15, 20 minutes or so, but then I need to be at the machine for make a quick cha changeover. And uh, that is an uh, investment. Gar uh, uh, giving them Garmin watches, it's like a $200 watch. It's quickly uh, paid back. And uh, I've actually been seeing this a lot lately, putting a bit of pride in making fast changeovers. I think last week they said it's a record of seven minutes. So seven minutes to offload the part and get the new parts in and have the machine running, processing the next part. And that was gives us the big opportunity to have uh, uh, at least quite high numbers of utilizations. Uh, we have a goal of 65%, uh, which is roughly our idea. If we can achieve that, we get 5,000 hours uh, out of a machine every year, which we think is a reasonable target taking into consideration the Swedish four weeks holiday, and so on. Uh, and then here it says nine hours to program end with no pause, meaning the machine is expected to run for another nine hours without any interference. Uh, so we've taken those programs quite far. Uh, more or less all programs are unmanned. They load the machine and it runs for 10 to 12 hours or something like that. So it runs very nice. Uh, having said that, and having a bit of... Uh, uh, no, I want to show something else there. There, right? Speak, about, uh, speak a bit more about quality then. Uh, from this view, we can then go into and uh, look at the quality data. We change from the operator's view to the engineering's view. Uh, this will take some minutes to download here uh, with a signal, but uh, prepare a bit. <laughs> Actually, the live data of this part, 
still the same part. And then we have some, as it says here, some four, close to 400 characteristics. And we want to achieve the CPK 2.0 or Six Sigma. And as you know, then 99.99997% is expected to be within tolerance. And we, we are there for 87% of the requirements. So we've taken it far. Uh, and then we display the 15 worst ones, which are the ones we uh, work the hardest to try uh, trying to improve. See, uh, that means it was updated, so continuously live. Uh, still 87%. Uh, and so if you look there, there were some uh, one to six, uh, five or six part now, uh, characteristics below uh, three sigma for a start with CPK 1.0. Then you have to dig into them to understand what's uh, what's happening, what's going on, what can we improve. And then you need to know your part. Now I happen to know that the first one that looks pretty shitty uh, is uh, uh, in process tolerance uh, for some uh, diameter. We need to control it in process to know that it turns out okay after shot peening. So it's that one is not a product requirement, it's what we need to control the process. Then just checking the numbers, and I happen to know that the two ones here in the middle are, I think they're interesting because it explains how tricky or tight the dimensions are when measuring those uh, plus minus uh, three microns. We pull the measurement probe in the CMM and it, uh, when pulling it on the surface, it gathers small, small particles of dust, and then it vibrates. And it uh, ruins my CPK va values. But uh, we haven't really figured out how to resolve that one, but we know what it is. So it's actually, so we gather our ME team uh, at least weekly, depending on uh, how it looks, to go through this data, reviewing the trends, reviewing uh, uh, improvement actions and so on. Actually, uh, also very nice to have it live all the time. Uh, if then go back, because uh, uh, <laughs> I actually want to show this because I'm pretty pretty happy or proud about this uh, the way we have uh, made this part robust and now has made it uh, into a lot of automation. So having a bit of signal problem today, I actually wanted to show the last weeks. Those are the five machines I have running those parts for this uh, uh, engine program. And the numbers we achieve out here, I don't know if you can read them, we are around, for three machines, they're around 89% utilization. Then you can talk, is it good, is it bad? Leaves, it leaves about two and a half hours still to, you, to use in the, within the day. So room for improvement, but still pretty good. And we got, uh, it's, it, this represents the last 24 hours. So in this last 24 hours, we got two, six, 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 four, what's that? 25, 25 hours of unmanned machining which is what I mean when, when once we get the quality right, we can optimize and start making money. If we don't have the quality with us, this is not, uh, as you know, really possible. Uh, so that's where we are right now with this. The next step, and not too many questions about this one, because this is <laughs> brand new, what we are trying to work on right now to further develop. If we don't as you know, if you don't uh, keep on developing, we move in the other direction. So now, right now, on those machines, for those parts, we're trying to learn more about the signals we can collect from the machines. Vibration signals, temperatures, and so on. And can we connect, can we connect the signals that we can measure to the uh, output? In the, uh, in the, for the qu quality output. Can we actually learn something from the signals? And uh, 
we've been uh, gathering data here for a few months and uh, we think we can see the connections that we can almost predict if we're going to achieve a bad result uh, in the end. So then the next step here is that, uh, okay, if we can predict it, can we actually teach the machine to compensate automatically? So this is the next step, what we are developing right now with our uh, internally. Hopefully up and running in a, well, I don't know, end of the year maybe. Uh, uh, all right, I think <laughs> that's what I had prepared. Any easy questions? That was fantastic, Thomas. For that one probe that was collecting the grit or dirt, yeah. have you looked at degaussing or demagnetizing it to prevent that from happening? Would that help? Uh, my, my honest answer is I don't know, but I will check. Yeah. Because we had that issue uh, in our valve area many years ago where you would, on these very tight three micron, five micron tolerances, yeah. and by degaussing uh, as part of the setup, that helped a lot in eliminating that foreign object uh, that could impact the measurement. That's a great tip. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Yeah, welcome. Is this your system, like homegrown or... It's wonderful. Uh, this this one here, yeah, is a uh, homegrown. Uh, the other ones I showed you are partly purchased. the The daily management is is a purchased system. Okay. Uh, which we have adapted a bit. Uh, also, Copal is a purchase system which is adapted. Yep. But uh, so a, a, a mix. Yeah, I mean, you showed a great example of the coming. Uh, you're, the future is here with the machines making the decisions in the future. Yeah. Uh, process we, we, control built right into the actual equipment using the data on the inputs that you're starting to measure. That, that was a great, great enlightening uh, yeah, I hope we get thing there. for us to uh, see. We, we will get there. It's just about yeah. a matter of time, I guess. Yeah, it will take time. Yeah, because we also, also <clears throat> right now, testing the... Uh, uh, change of parts automatically if we don't need uh, oh, if, we, if we get that which we think we can and get this well, of course then we can increase productivity uh, even a lot further yeah. okay. thank you yeah. have a go at it more questions would you like to have someone like this at home? <laughs> More questions, someone? Yeah, thank you, Thomas. That was really, um, love the system. Is this a homegrown it's control? A mix. It's a mix. So a mix. Uh, this is a homegrown. Uh, this is purchased and, uh, and adapted. Uh, if we just, uh, this is a, a purchased, homegrown, and homegrown. So it's a it's a it's a mix of uh, uh, adapting uh, things we can buy or developing ourselves. Yeah, I love the visualization. I think um, you know we can all learn something here. This is great. Thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, m many thanks for the presentation, it's fantastic. And I wanted to ask you something, because we are also maybe sometimes struggling with it, and any tips, it's always good. Uh, so to have plenty of system, it's important to, um, to make data easy to access. That's great. Uh, but after that, we need people to look at it and to discuss and to... How was the, um, the way to ensure that they meet every week? Because you've got plenty of parts, plenty of measurement, plenty of things. So how to make them work together and, and put this action plan, this improvement plan in order to, to improve? Yeah. Uh, what, uh, <laughs> I, I agree with you. The data is one thing. It's not, it's not easy, but that's one thing. Uh, 
first uh, we have, uh, or I have tried to uh, delegate as much as possible to the team. This is a, a, a cell producing this to make the team leader and the operators responsible for the targets. So everything is on display at the machines. And, uh, and, and giving them the prerequisites, they had the idea with the watches. Yeah, okay, great idea, let's do that. And uh, uh, from there on, we tried to form cross-functional teams with some, uh, high, uh, some uh, MEs, manufacturing, engineering, to actually dive into the data uh, continuously uh, exploring it. And we have, uh, we can't address everything. We don't have the capacity. But we have some selected some, uh, you know, tw top 20% of our parts that accounts for the, you know, 80% of the sales and, uh, and hours and so on. Those we want to optimize. So we gather around those parts cross-functionally, uh, weekly or bi-weekly, uh, just trying to, to improve, improve quality, improve uh, cost. The other 80% we want to make predictable, but I'm not going to optimize them. But I want them predictable. If I start a forging, I want a disk. Many thanks. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank you. More questions for Thomas? Someone? Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was waiting for it to come over from over there. Yeah. Um, I, firstly, brilliant, and, it, and it's lovely to see live data. I mean, that's so important. It just shows the truth, you know, rather than pre-prepared stuff. Um, I'm really interested in, because I think this is a journey, um, and what are some of the significant things you would say? So if you were to sort of just say, and I'm really appreciating, I'm not trying to put you on the spot or anything, I really would love to know, your, you, you sort of, if you were to describe over the, whenever you think something started in this journey, and what were some, some significant things that happened on it over time? So if it was two years right. ago, what was the first thing, the sort of second thing? It'd be really good to know your, your insights on that. Yeah, for we started the uh, starter production, really. Yeah. Uh, from starter production, when we well, started bidding and winning on the parts, I think actually we did a, 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 a good start, I would say, having a team really analyzing the requirements. And uh, where we thought it was tricky requirements, we made some uh, manufacturing trials. Can we achieve those requirements with a decent CPK? decent yield and uh, we at that time some 10 years ago we we're pretty confident yes yes we can achieve this so uh, before signing the agreement we we kind of had an idea that those parts we can make robust and then make money uh, from there on i would say honestly we had a bit of a drop uh, some of the requirements turned out to be a lot harder more difficult than we thought to achieve uh, we were not as successful, but uh, after some time, probably more time than uh, than uh, I would have uh, liked, we strengthened the the team around the products uh, significantly to actually and start working really, really data driven to actually burn down all quality issues as much as possible and uh, continuously, continuously improving and validating. Uh, and since then, of course, we don't have the same amount of people that are actually since the, in, the, in the project phase, but still we have a, a decent sized team supporting those products, being a high volume product, a high amount of sales. We, uh, the idea is we can, we can never let it go. We have to continuously monitor it and continuously improve it. So I guess it's, that's, a, that's a mindset, I guess, is the, what's Im important to us. That it's, uh, it's something you get the question. So when, when, are, you, when, are, you, when are you finished? Uh, probably never. <laughs> continuously work with, uh, with uh, improving the quality, monitoring. But working in operations and production, the only thing you know is that no day is going to be as you expected. 
issues, problems, shit always happens in production. So you, you gotta you gotta pretty much appreciate that and then you just uh what say uh have the endurance to just uh, continue. I hope I answered. <laughs> yeah, no, that was good. It's sort of your early days, you want to understand the feasibility, so you trial stuff. Then you get into actually making parts as a realization what you thought, some surprises. And then the truth is things happen and you get a down, but then you've kept at it is what the message you're giving is. It's that continued belief will get you there. Um, and a real strong message about the importance of data is what I, I hear. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Getting nervous when it updates, but it still looks okay. <laughs> Is that it? Any other questions for Thomas? Well, thank you very much. This was really informative. There's right. one more question. <laughs> the, again, great CPK. Are there control charts backing that up? Yes. Okay, yes, and that's every, what the operator sees. Uh, yes, every every characteristic has a has a control chart uh, which the operator can, and I should say should access before starting an operation uh, to see do we have any trends. And of course, the system sends out the the different types of alarms or trends. Or but they, yes, they are. Yeah. I had one question too. Um, this is all great stuff. Does it also come into play like resharpen tools and tool life cycle? So you have a cutter. Does it help you calculate when to replace cutters? And do you use a resharpened cutter, a new cutter? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Of course, it it uh, it could help us uh, seeing uh, seeing trends in the uh, rating to cutter. But uh, uh, we have our own tool sharpening shop, but uh, being in, in Rotos, everything is also frozen processes. So if we have stated when qualifying that we're going to change a tool after every second part, then we have to. But, we, but of course, we see the trends and we think we have a good potential in cost savings that we, ex we could extend the tool life. Uh, but to do that, it takes uh, to sacrifice a part, making uh, making a cut up, sending it for approval. So it's a process, but we do we do collect some data uh, in regards to that. But not maybe as automated or as visual as this. More manually. Comes down to the opportunities are almost endless, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Once you start using the data. Thank you. I think that's it. Um, Thomas, thank you very much. Oh, this was you. really informative. Thank um, you. I enjoy it. Thank <laughs> oh, you. Oh, thank you. appreciate your coming. Oh, um, anytime. So, <laughs> a round of applause. Thank you.